classroom A or classroom B, we're trying to make a broader statement about how anxiety develops in children based on the measurements that we've collected, which just so happen have to be nested within these two different classrooms with completely two different types of teachers, which we know will impact the measurements. So coming full circle, that's exactly what we are trying to uh, address here. So let's talk about levels a little bit. Uh, levels uh, count from the bottom up. So level one here would be the student. Level two would be the class. So let's just say we have uh, six classes. We have 30 students who are distributed. Now I did it that way to just to make a point that uh, sample sizes can be small. Uh, you can imagine if we were doing some sort of regression model and we only had three students uh, in classroom two, uh, that would be problematic. Uh, mixed linear models uh, address those types of issues. Uh, there's a three-level model. Uh, again, we could have students within classes, uh, but these classes could come from two different school districts. Uh, so I'm going to demonstrate a, uh, a model that shows how to address this. It's actually pretty cool stuff, guys, guys um, or at least I hope you think it is. And uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the uh, level one has to be students. Level one, let's say that we we go in on a Friday and we teach a bunch of math facts and then we bring the students back in on Monday and ask them how many math facts that they can recall. So the recall factor could actually uh, be level one. So student one who was in class A recalled six facts and uh, student two recalled three and so on and so forth. So that's, uh, again, it's just a hierarchical linear modeling. I'm having trouble connecting <laughs> to the internet. Uh, well, Take a look at the help section in your Alexa app. Well, Alexa doesn't like my... <laughs> That's hilarious. All right, so benefits of multi-level modeling. Uh, again, you can... This assumption of uh, equal regression slopes, it addresses that. It addresses the independence assumption, and missing data is easily handled. Uh, up until multi-level modeling, missing data would... Uh, just just drives you crazy, you know. What do you do? You, do you eliminate case wise, variable wise? Do you? A lot of people insert the mean. Yeah, I don't know. it's just crazy stuff. Uh, uh, just fabricating measurements just to uh, appease a missing cell. So we're getting. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about fixed and random effects. Uh, yep, confusing and contextual. So a treatment effect is fixed if all possible treatment conditions are included in the experiment. Uh, a treatment effect is random if, here I go, I'm reading the PowerPoint to you. Uh, a treatment effect is random if the treatments included in the experiment are a random sample of all possible treatment conditions. Now, let's think about instructional techniques, you know, traditional online hybrid. Uh, would that be a fixed or random effect? Well, it depends. If that's the only three that we have, then it would be a fixed effect. But let's say there's some fourth or fifth or sixth or whatever instructional techniques, and we just decide to pull these out, uh, but we still want to generalize to whatever measurement that we're taking, uh, then that would be a random effect. So it just depends. Uh, it depends on uh, the context of the question. Guys, there's an excellent video out there, uh, Dr. John Neslick. Uh, he's, uh, I, I just think it's exceptional. Um, I'll post this PowerPoint, so if you want to click that link. and it, It's kind of a lengthy video, but uh, he's, uh, he's, he does an exceptional job on that. So Now let's get into uh, some, uh, I don't know, contradictions, if you will. Self-efficacy and scores. Well, guys, if we examine group one, group two, group three, if we look within group one, we see a negative relationship. If we look in group two, we see a negative relationship. And if we look in group three, we see a negative relationship. Notice the, the scores. Let me see if I can bring them to your attention. Uh, the scores in the second column, this would just be the, uh, the whatever the independent variable score is. This would be the dependent. Notice the dependent variable as X is increased, our Y's are decreasing. However, notice when we look at the means, as we increase our X's, 
our overall means are increasing. So within each group, we have a negative relationship, but when we examine the group uh, performance, you know, by examining the mean, we get a positive relationship. So that's called a negative within, positive between uh, group relationship. As you can imagine, there can be other ways. Uh, this one, group one has an, a positive relationship. Group two has a positive. Group three has a positive. Yet when we look at the overall effect, we see that we, uh, our group means we have a negative relationship. So that would be something like this. Notice that for all three groups that the, the slopes, which are in the, the kind of the pale blue, uh, I know I take that back. Group two uh, actually has no relationship. Uh, the Ys are all 10. So, uh, wow, I just blew that one, guys. Uh, group one has a negative relationship. Group two has a no relationship. And group three has a positive relationship. So we have varying within group, but a positive between group relationship. Now, if you were to... With traditional regression techniques, if you were to model this, you'd have really, you know, you, you could just throw all the data in. looks like you'd have 15 points. Uh, and if you did a model not paying attention to the group in which the student was nested, uh, you're going to show a very strong positive relationship. Uh, but, you know, just from the the diagram to the right, you can tell that there's a lot more going on here. We need to account for the dependence in group one, group two, and group, group three uh, when generalizing our results. Uh, so the model. Guys, the model gets a little uh, complicated. Uh, let's say that we're doing depression. We're measuring depression. Uh, kind of, well, actually, we did anxiety earlier. So, oh, well. <laughs> okay. So pre pretend that we spell anxiety, D-E-P-R-E-S-S-I-O-N. So the anxiety is equal to the anxiety of the person I who belongs to a therapist J. So by doing HLMs, again, mixed model, uh, we allow us, it allows us to model different slopes and different intercepts for each group. So exam for the example here, we have depression IJ, again, that's the depression, anxiety, a person I who is attending therapy sessions with therapy J. So we have a, uh, an intercept, BOJ, plus our slope, B1J, times the stress uh, of the particular person, plus an error component. Now, what we do in the second bullet there is we get BOJ and B1J, these are the slopes. Well, if you look at the gamma zero zero, gamma one zero, those are that would be the overall intercept. Well, there's going to be a deviation from the overall intercept to what the intercept is for each therapist. So this is just a correction. Think of this as being the error term. So this is kind of like the overall intercept, but this is the intercept. There will be three of these because we have well. Well, yeah, we had three earlier. I'm kind of playing this off the anxiety uh, where we had three uh, um, therapists. So we would have BO1, uh, BO2, BO3. And of the grand intercept, each one of those would deviate. So we would add a component here to create inequality. Same thing with the slope. Uh, we have an overall um, uh slope and then we have a slope for each model and this is just the correction factor that makes those two equal all right so i think i did yeah here we go so the yeah yeah i don't know why i talked but there it is um so again grand intercept grand slope uh and this will become hopefully clearer when i uh we jump into R and start creating some pretty cool graphs and stuff. All right, guys, uh, the random effect. Wow, that's kind of a different look, isn't it? I don't know where that came from. So um, from the estimates, guys, this sigma is just universally, you know, the standard deviation of the errors and the standard deviation 
of the UIJs, we can compute what's called the interclass inter inter correlation. Uh, <coughs> and uh, this ratio uh, tells us the proportion of variability that is due to the cluster variable. Uh, so the higher the ICC, the more we need HLNs. Otherwise, we're going to inflate our type uh, 1 error rates for pretty obvious reasons, right? Um, so, yeah, that stuff. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, read that and put that in your trash can of useless information. Actually, it's useful. It's very useful information, but uh, not something that uh, I don't know. Well, it may come up. Uh, actually, that may come up in our second example. So, guys, the objectives. What I want you to know. Uh, I want you to think more about the independence of assumption. Know the difference between the three types of modeling. Um, and just, just all that stuff. Take a screenshot and, um, and read it. All right. All right, guys, that's it. Uh, we'll get on in the next video. We'll get to, uh, to some really cool stuff actually. So take care.